Th thank you very much, Boris, and, and thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to get this opportunity to talk. I'm very grateful to Boris for, for setting this up for me. Um, you're all getting to hang out and, and work in my vacation spot. So I, I just come here to be on vacation, and you all are getting good science done. So uh, it's been a real pleasure to work for a day and a half while I'm, while I'm hanging out here. As Boris said, I'm, I'm originally trained um, in the fluid dynamics tradition of applied mathematics, and then I uh, somehow got converted over to thinking about computational social science um, for, for various reasons that I find very stimulating and very interesting. And what I hope to do with this hour is show you some reasons why it's interesting. Um, what, I'd, what I'm going to try to do is uh, build to explaining um, this paper that uh, appeared almost a year ago. Um, it's work that I did with Thomas Richardson and, and Kevin Macon. You can't see those names. I know that, but, um, but I can. It's a reminder. Uh, Thomas and Kevin were both bright undergrads at, uh, at Chapel Hill who uh, helped contribute to this work. And this is also work with Mason Porter from Oxford, my longtime uh, collaborator and co-author, dating back to when he and I were both at Georgia Tech together. And uh, you'll see his name pop up all over the place. So I, I don't even bother with his name. They'll, he'll just show up as initials. And J.P. Onella at Harvard uh, also contributed to this work. And what we did in this work is we took one of the outstanding uh, perspectives on so-called community structure or detection of community structure in networks. And we showed a way to principally generalize it to a more complex data type that wasn't just one network, but multiple networks describing different relationships between the same actors, whether those are relationships of different kinds of interactions or they're different interactions as they vary across time. And so what I'll try to do is, is build, to, uh, build to what I mean when I say those things. Um, before I dive in, um, of course, the, it's important to emphasize where, where the money for this came from. Uh, a big chunk of this came from the NSF, um, supporting both myself and, and the two students, Thomas and Kevin. Uh, Mason is supported by a, a James S. McDonald Foundation Award, and um, JP was, uh, was supported by a Fulbright Award. What I'd like to do is take about the first half of this talk and, and since it's a colloquium, try to give you some background on what do I mean when I even talk about community detection, and in particular, the modularity perspective on community detection. Uh, we'll try to have some fun, try to show you some pretty pictures, um, some interesting applications where identifying community structures in networks has been useful. And then that'll lead us into what I'm calling the multi-slice framework and what I mean here by these multi-slice networks and how we generalize modularity to those and give you some fun examples. So the caveat that goes out here is best summarized by my colleague Jim Moody. Uh, Jim is the leader of the new Duke Network Analysis Center that we have in the triangle at that rival school that maybe I should just be grateful that basketball season for my school is over and for his school is over so we can be friends again now for, uh, for at least until next March. And um, he's been accused of turning everything into a network. And, and this was something he said at one of our starting Duke Network Analysis Center meetings. Jim's a, a very well-known sociologist in the tradition of social network analysis. And we have a vibrant interdisciplinary conversation going on uh, between different departments at Duke and at UNC. And uh, my response was, OK, well, at least you're only accused of turning everything into a network. I'm, I'm accused of turning everything into a network and then trying to turn it into a graph partitioning problem. And you'll see that in some of the work that we highlight, particularly in the first half of the talk here. And the, the goal of this work is that if you want to understand what I will, for lack for a sort of a simplistic way of saying it, function on a network, what are the dynamics on the network, what are processes on the network, and you want to have a simplified description of these, you have to understand the structure of the interconnections on which those dynamics are taking place. And there's an interplay between these structures and these functions. Um, so just as a toy example here is a visual depiction of a particular network. And you can see, just eyeballing this visual depiction of it, that there are some very clumpy regions that are well connected, but then are, there are long paths that get you between those different regions. And so just try to imagine spread of any process on this network. It could be spread of a behavior. Who's going to go out and buy iPads? Who's going to get um, influenza from each other? 
Um, any, any process you want to think about on this network, if it's a spreading process that spreads through these connections, then to get from this end of the network over to this end of the network, well, it might be very well mixed here. And you could imagine something like an analog of a mean field theory or some other reduced order model being very good here. But it needs to transport from here all the way over into these groups over here. So trying to understand these groups, understanding the clumps, gives you information about understanding cascades through the network. And this going back and forth between structure and function is, is really the motivation for everything I'm talking about today. But I'm kind of lying to you when I say, well, this is what the real world looks like. I mean, this is a small network. It's very simplistic. I'm basically saying, OK, there are two nodes here. Whatever they represent, they're actually co-authors in a, a set of network science papers. Um, so everyone in here is a, a physicist. Um, I don't know if any of them are in the room, um, maybe. Uh, but uh, the links between them are that they happen to write papers together. This is just one way in which people are connected. And if you want to think about how they might be influencing each other, whether it's influencing different ideas of the statistical mechanics of networks, or actually one of them infecting another one of them with the flu, then you need to look at the different ways in which they're connected to each other. So what we're going to try to do today is talk about how we might extend, this is a very deliberately toy model schematic, how are we going to extend the notion that if we have one network between actors that describes one type of interaction, and we have, in this case, three other networks between not necessarily the identical actors, but overlapping sets of actors, how are we going to do clustering on this data set in a way that's principled that might help us um, take the data that we get from this, take the what effectively is data mining from this, and go understand or try to understand different processes on this network. Um, so what I will be doing, as I, as I indicated, is uh, we'll tell you a little bit about modularity and what do I mean by that word. And uh, modularity is a previously well-described and, and very widely studied process of identifying clusters in a single network. How are we going to extend modularity to a data set like this, where we might have the same actor? So um, when I'm talking about these multi-slice networks, this string of dots connected together by the red dashed lines might represent the same individual. But this is the individual's connections to other individuals in the data set in type 4 versus a different connectivity in type 3. And so the red arcs are identity. They're the notion that it's the same person. And how are we going to extend modularity to this data set is, um, is our goal for today. And again, the motivation is really that if you want to understand any functional processes on the data it help, uh, on a network like this, it helps to identify the structures. So these are uh, some nice hierarchical pictures um, from my colleague Aaron Clausette. Uh, if you do a visual depiction of a network, it might just look like a big tangled ball. But if you manage to identify, um, and here identified as a tree of just sort of, OK, we have um, no hierarchical structure in this, but this data tweezed apart in the right way might really have three communities or groups or clusters, whatever word you want to use, that then themselves might have subgroups that are well mixed. And so again, you might expect that some kind of reduced order, mean field, first order correction uh, kind of dynamics for whatever process you're interested in might work really well on these groups or these subgroups. And then the challenge becomes how to tie them together. That's not where we're going to get to today. We're just going to get to the level of how do we even identify these groups. In this particular picture, this is just a Kamada Kawai. Uh, so oh, yes. I mean, and in fact, right, this is, this is supposed to be the same network redrawn three different ways. And the lengths are, there's, uh, graph visualization is itself, I mean, an enormous field that has an annual international conference and challenges um, set out of how do you visualize this data set. And uh, so that's, a, that's always an important piece of, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of pretty pictures that on the one hand you can sort of say, well, are they just pretty pictures? Or on the other hand, is there something meaningful in the visualization itself? 
So trying to pack way too much information in too quickly to get to the, the statement that everything we're going to be talking about is in the modularity perspective. I need to say that graph partitioning is an enormous field. It's a classic problem in computer science uh, with decades of background in it, with many different, way, many different questions and many different uh, solutions to those questions. If you sort of think about, well, why in computer science? I mean, a, a classic problem in computer science is I have a calculation that I want to parallel process across a, a, a group of processors. And what you want to do, because the most costly thing to do in that parallel computation is to communicate between the processors, I want to organize my calculation to minimize the amount of communication between processors. And so here you have different components of a calculation, might be the nodes of a network representation. The edges represent the amount of communication that needs to run between those processes. And now you want to group which pieces of the calculation are done on which processor so that you minimize the amount of communication that has to, actually has to go between two distinct processes, two, two distinct processors. That's a clustering problem. You want to group your nodes so that the closely connected items are all on the same processor. Um, the perspective we're going to take of how do we, how are we going to look at processing a network data set into clusters is organized around something called modularity, which was introduced by Mark Newman and his then student, Michelle Gervon. And it was really introduced as the answer to the question, how many groups should I cluster my data into? Uh, his idea was a good group, a good community, would be one with many more connections inside the group than you would expect on average. And so a good partitioning of a network, assigning every node in the network to, to, one gr to a group, would be one that optimized the number of edges that you had inside the groups, minus what you would expect at random. Now that's sort of an interesting statement, minus what you expect at random. You might, as a first pass, say, well, why don't I just maximize the, num the total weight of edges between the groups? That, that would be a fine approach, except for that it has a rather trivial solution. Take your connected component and call it a group. You have, you have taken the total weight of that network and said it is inside the group. So if you instead want to partition this group up into some number of communities, you need some other pressure in the optimization to force you to break up into smaller groups. And that was this statement of minus what you would expect at random. We'll mathematize that in a second. And the recurring theme of this talk is, well, but what do you really mean at random? In what model? And the answer to that question is, if you can answer that question in some meaningful way, that's really going to be the answer for us about how do we extend the notion of modularity to this multi-slice network framework. Because I'm me. Whatever network you might say that I'm a part of, if I've got multiple slices representing different kinds of, kinds of connections, maybe one of them is today, the fact I'm in the room here with all of you. One of them is tomorrow, hanging out with my wife and my kids. One of them's the next day. I'm still me. So the edge connecting me to myself tomorrow and then connecting myself to the next day, those are definitional. They're there at random or at not. And the entire question that we're going to be addressing in this work here is, well, how do we take that into account in, in a modularity framework where what we're saying is that a good partition is one that maximizes the total edge weight relative to what you expect at random. There, are, um, uh, there is what I might call a survey article and um, an, an excellent review. This one's a bit of a tome. So that's why I say this one's only a survey. Um, they're, they're both um, good up to date. Well, I'd like to think this one's good. That one I definitely know is good. Um, they're both good uh, up to date uh, surveys or reviews of, of the state of what you might um, call community detection. And um, again, the modularity perspective goes back to Michelle Gervon and Mark Newman. And, and here's just an example from their uh, 2002 paper that really kicked a lot of this off in the statistical physics community. Um, here, each one of the nodes is a person affiliated with the Santa Fe Institute, which they were both affiliated with at, at the time. And the edges are co-authorship. 
between people again. We, 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 we like the navel gazing of the co-authorship graphs. Um, and, and in this case, it's, uh, I mean, this one's sort of a, a toy problem in the sense that it, it has communities only insofar as there are a few key links, right? There's a, there's a key link here between the statistical physics crowd and the RNA crowd. And if it wasn't for the papers that these two people wrote together, they, this graph wouldn't even be connected at that point. But they um, looked at different algorithms for identifying communities in this data, and the Color, well, here it's sort of grayscale, and the shapes are the different communities that were algorithmically identified from this co-authorship data set, and it corresponds very nicely and neatly to the um, clear uh, field specializations of the people at SFI at the time. Uh, so getting to the mathematization that I, that I promised you here, what we're going to do, I mean, I'll, I'm going to try to minimize the math because I just, my eyes glaze over when I look at math in a talk like this. When we talk about the, the quality of the partition or, or the modularity Q, what, uh, this is really just the mathematical statement of what I was saying before, our network is defined as some adjacency matrix, AIJ. So A is the, the starting point of almost any network analysis. I have an adjacency matrix. It tells me the strength of the connection between actor I and actor J, node I and node J. If uh, you can have many different kinds of network representations, you can have directed networks where I might point to J but not necessarily back. It could be undirected where there's a symmetry, I going to J um, means that there's a connection going from J to I. You might have unweighted graphs where all the elements of A are either zero or one. You can have weighted graphs where the non-zero elements of A might represent the strength of a connection. Irrespective of all those details, the common modularity framework is to take that adjacency matrix and compare it to some null model P. So what's the probability or the expected weight of a connection in, a, in the weighted sense of a connection between nodes I and J? And then simply sum over all situations where the community that node I has been assigned to is the same as the community that node J has been assigned to. So if you have a partition of the network, so every node has been assigned a community, CI, then this sum inside of the groups is just saying in a summation exactly what I said on a couple slides ago of summing up the total weight of all the connections minus what you would expect at random inside those groups. And our goal then is a combinatorial optimization problem. It's how do we pick the assignments of the groups so as to optimize, to maximize this quality. Of course, this combinatorial optimization problems are really hard. This one is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's NP bad. Um, it's uh, provably so, not by me. Um, there are a lot of different computational heuristics that you can use. I, I don't want to, I kind of want to hide behind there being many different ways that you might go about trying to optimize this queue. Let's just say that you have many good heuristics that are out there and again appeal to the survey article and the review article that, that there are a lot of different ways that you could go about doing this. And there are a lot of packages that are just uh, publicly available. So you, if you have a data set and you want to do uh, sort of standard modularity on them. Um, iGraph is one possibility. The so-called Louvain code, which we'll use extensively later on, is, is another. But I'm still not specifying a big piece of the problem for you here. I haven't told you anything about what P is. And in fact, picking P is, is really where all the work is. Uh, Mark and Michelle, Mark Newman and Michelle Gervon's answer to this was that Okay, well, the, the simplest model, which isn't even on the page here, would be to say that the probability of any edge between any two nodes is just some probability constant P, independent of who the nodes are. That would be equivalent in the mathematical literature to saying that your null model was a so-called erdos renyi random graph. But lots of the contributions, particularly from the statistical physics community and networks over, the, say, the last 15 years, have been all thematically circling around the idea that real networks are a lot more complicated than that. erdos renyi graphs, where you say the probability of a, of a connection between any pair of nodes is just some fixed constant p, they're simple. 
All your statistics are Poisson statistics. You can say lots of nice things about them. They have a nice percolation transition. It's, it's a well-studied problem. Real data is much more complicated than that. Uh, for instance, degree distributions, the number of edges that a node has. In a real data set, go to the web, look at a, um, as just, as just you know, one enormous example, look at all the interlinks between web pages. There are some web pages that have lots of links pointed to them, and there are some web pages that have very few. This is very far from a Poisson distribution. So the notion, particularly coming from the statistical physics community over this period, has been that the heterogeneity of the network is much more complicated than an erdos renyi random graph would lead you to believe. And so Newman and Gervan's uh, definition of modularity respected that. Ki here is the total weight of the edges associated with node i. And in, in this particular case, if you have an undirected graph, so if there's a link from i to j, then there's the same link going from j back to i. What Mark and Michelle did really kind of in the sense of on the back of a napkin was say, well, let's have our model be not just that we, let's not make them independent and identically distributed probabilities of edges, but let's have them be independent edges constrained to uh, the expected degree distribution, which is actually the observed degree distribution. So given Ki and Kj from the data, that is, it's really just row sums and column sums of the adjacency matrix A, then the probability of there being a link between I and J is proportional to some function of those two degrees under the independence, cons uh, independence constraint. And they worked out really kind of almost back of the envelope, a nice little simple formula that the probability of it being there is proportional to the product of the number of edges or the total weight of edges coming out of both I and J. And here 2W is just a scaling factor that helps you normalize everything. It's the total weight of all the edges. Um, the gamma is a so-called resolution parameter. I'm going to kind of shove that thing under the rug. There's a long and interesting story of how the modularity perspective has changed over the last 10 years um, about the need to include a resolution parameter and look at different resolution parameters um, in, in large part motivated um, by these papers, but also by uh, work by Santo Fortunato and Mark Bethelemy. Um, I'm really going to sort of table that. It's the so-called resolution limit. And there's also uh, some problems with the degeneracy of the landscape that you're trying to combinatorially optimize. These are things that people are trying to deal with. I'm going to kind of try to stay clear of them today and instead focus on other null models that you might choose. So again, this is still just the same formula again. I want to optimize Q, summing over inside the groups and counting up the total edge weight from the adjacency matrix A, and I need this model P. I need some null model P. Um, again, Erdos Renyi would have just been to say that the probability of any edge between I and J is just some fixed constant. Newman and Gervon say, well, if we want to include information about the degree distribution and have a model that's independent but conditional on achieving those expected degrees, we get a product of degrees. And these last two are really just to say that this is sort of a, a well-honed problem now at this point. If you have a network with a different structure. So Newman and Gervon, that works nicely for undirected graphs. They can be weighted, they can be, they can be binary. But what if they're directed? What if the number of links going out of a node are different than the number of links coming in, like on the web, right? Your hyperlinks going out are a different count of links than those coming in. So now this is an example of a directed network. And the generalization of this, again, um, some work by Mark Newman with his then student Elizabeth Like, is that, well, we need to separately count the number of connections coming in and the, next, the, the connections coming out. Um, a slightly different uh, null model is one for a so-called bipartite graph. So a bipartite graph is one where you can color the nodes, say, red and blue, and every edge in the network has a red node on one end and a blue node on the other end. So you can, this is almost, if you like, the opposite of a good clustering problem. You want to identify the red and the blue nodes, and now every edge connects something from this side to something on that side. Well, if that's a known piece of your data, if you're going to go try to find groups in that data, you need to respect that underlying structure. This is going to be something of a theme, that when we get to the multi-slice networks, we have to respect the structure 
of the kind of networks that we have and that they have these identity arcs in them. If you've got a bipartite network and you know that every edge connects a red to a blue, then your null model, if you're going to do the problem in a nice principled way, your null model should respect that there are only edges between red and blue. So if, uh, if PIJ is the probability or the expected weight of connection between a red and a blue node, then it has some value where K might be the degrees of the red nodes and D might be the degrees of the blue nodes. But if PIJ is what's the expected weight of the connection between two blue nodes in a bipartite network, well, clearly that has to be zero by the construction of the data. And uh, we're going to come back to this bipartite. Um, the idea here, again, is, is that, well, if I just blindly go in with some of these back of the envelope kinds of calculations in the multi-slice setting, where I'm connected to myself tomorrow and then connected to myself the, the next day, those are purely definitional. They, 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 they might appear as links, but they also have to appear as any statement of what's there at random. So they don't, they don't contribute at all to this modularity framework as phrased in this back of the envelope kind of probability calculation. So we'll get back to that. First, we're just going to show you the quick picture show of some neat examples where community detection is sort of does interesting things. But we'll first take a question. Right. Right. At the level of, of what's right here, right, this is part of the problem, and this is what we're trying to address, is that at the level of these null models in this community detection here, this is presuming you start with a single adjacency matrix AI, with components AIJ. But what if you've got something more complicated than that? What if you have layers or slices or types or time, any of these things? That's really the, that's really the question of how do we extend this picture to handle that much more interesting data. But first, we want to show you that even this picture works nicely on some toy models. Um, yes, please. Oh, so so if you if you have a tripartite, so there's reasons for tripartite networks. So I had a, yeah, so um, I won't belabor why, but yeah, you could easily have three classes. You could have red, blue, and green, and you only have red, blue connections and blue to green connections, or maybe you only have red, blue, blue, green, and red, green. Depends on on your problem. Yeah, then you have to extend this logic, though it's not hard to extend in that case. That you your null model has to forbid red-red connections, it has to forbid blue-blue connections, and you end up having to have to separately count the degrees of the blue nodes from the red nodes from the green nodes. Yeah. Well, these are all in the bad NP. <laughs> I mean, they're all in a bad class to begin with, yeah. <laughs> so irrespective of, of, uh, of this question, they're all already pretty ugly. But luckily, there are a lot of good heuristics that, that seem to do a very good job. Um, the fact that they do a good job is actually has something bad to say about the degeneracy of the landscape. But other than that statement, I'll try to stay away from it. Um, so there's this classic problem. You can't talk about community structure without showing a picture of the Zachary Karate Club. Um, much to the bemusement of all of us who work in the field, we, we've all, we've all done this terrible thing where we use this data set because it's sort of the sociologist's favorite data set to talk about a partitioning problem. So the story goes that Zachary was, or at least the urban myth, is that Zachary was a sociologist and it, he was really studying a karate club at a, in a university setting. It had 34 members all chopping bricks or whatever together and um, all getting along in a nice happy way and then they had a fight one day over who was going to be the next leader of the dojo or whatever and the, I mean, and this was like the sociologist's dream come true, right? He was in the middle of doing this whole survey about who's friends with whom outside the club and how strongly they were friends, and he got to observe this fight firsthand, and the, the club split up into two rival karate clubs. And some handful of the members went the one way, and some handful of the members went the other way. And it turns out that if you had a priori gone in and said, okay, 
here's the friendship matrix between these 34 individuals. And you said, this club is going to fracture into two clubs. Predict who would go where. That pretty much any computational clustering problem you tried to throw at this should get the answer right. Modulo one or two people who are in the, who are in the middle. So this is another example of just a visualization of the network. Um, I forget what kind of force directed layout we used here, but um, obviously what, um, ignore the symbols, those are sort of separate, but clearly the, the, uh, fill, the filled in color nodes went one way, the open loops went another way, and almost any computational clustering trick you try to throw at this data should predict that the split is right there, except for maybe you know this individual, you could probably classify either way. If your method doesn't work on this data set, go home. Because, um, be, uh, because it's just, it's nice and clean. There are very few links that connect the dark nodes to the light nodes here. And this is just a, a tree representation of the split. Um, in fact, uh, it, depending on, on the methodology you use, you can even sort of find four groups here that have been identified by these splits. So this is sort of a sub, two subgroups of the light nodes, two subgroups of the dark nodes. They're represented here as a tree, but I like to take my trees and wrap them around for, uh, to pack more information on them. So the root of the tree is in the middle, and you go out from the middle to the leaves to see the splitting. So you can see um, that, uh, that this was just one uh, computational identification of the, of the hierarchy of communities. And the light and the dark nodes here are actually who went where. So it's a, it's a perfect match. Um, in the interest of time, since I promised that the first half of the talk I was going to show you these things, I'm now just going to move into pretty picture fat, too fast uh, zone to say that there's a lot of work out there using community detection to address this, um, this theme of how structure and function influence each other. There's some important work on metabolic networks um, by, by Guimera and, and Amaral. Um, there's some really neat work on some mobile phone data that my colleague uh, J.P. Onella did with um, a number of people. Um, this is just a, a, a visual representation of each one of the dots here is a person. And the, the links are that there were actually phone calls between, well, I mean, so I guess it's not really a person, it is an actual mobile phone, but hopefully only used by one or a handful of people. And the links are, are connections between them. The reason you might want to study this is you might want to understand the spread of information through the network. So if you injected a new piece of information at one of these nodes, then the, the dream is that understanding these structures, you could better describe the flow of information through this network. Um, we've had a lot of fun in my group, um, again, working with Mason Porter, um, working with a pair of students, looking at some old Facebook data. We've got. Um, uh, a paper to appear in SIAM Review and another one that's uh, recently put on, on, our, on the archive in the last month, looking at how community structures correlate really well with different demographic traits. So this is actually some, um, some old data from the Facebook network of friends of different users who were students at Caltech. And the, uh, this particular visualization is not terribly enlightening in this form. It's a big tangled ball of connections. Every, dot, every symbol here is a person's Facebook page. And every edge between them is that they, they friended each other on Facebook. The symbols and colors in combination together indicate the uh, residential houses that the students live in at Caltech. And so the social question here was how well correlated are different demographic characteristics at Caltech with this complete information of their online social network life. And it, um, so we looked at things like what were their majors, um, things like class years, where did they live, et cetera. And it turns out that the Caltech data is very well, uh, the clustering is very well correlated with their residential houses in a way that's very different than other universities. Um, so here, this is, this is a representation of the same data, only now what I've done is I've collapsed the individual users into pies. Each pie is a community identified by, by these algorithmic methods. And the colors now are indicating the houses. So you can see that this one is almost all blue with, with purple. Um, this one is almost all maroon with a big chunk of purple and a few others. This one's sort of two colors plus purple. And what I haven't told you is what purple is. Purple is... The, the users who did not identify what house they were affiliated with. I mean, this is a poor man's quick data mining here for you know, any marketing person to love. 
if, if, I, if I wanted to identify what house were those purple users most likely affiliated with, I think I'd, I think I'd go very quickly and guess maroon. And it, so there's this enormous amount of information about you if you are a Facebook, this is sort of my warning scary statement. If you are a regular Facebook user or any other social network, and you know, there's this almost, to me, frightening amount of information about all of us out there on the web. Even if we're not putting it there, it's inferable from the pieces of information that our friends put out there about themselves. Everyone, I mean, you, with high degree of certainty, you could be predicting the houses of these purple users, even though there's no direct information about what house they're affiliated with, just simply from the link structure and from the other information that their friends put about themselves. Three or four more quick pictures, and then we'll have just enough time to sort of bring it all home for what we did. Um, I've, had, I've also fallen into a, uh, Mason and I have fallen into a, a number of, of fun political science collaborations using these tools. Uh, if you sort of, uh, you know, sort of think about the legislative process. People are assigned, so the, uh, people in, in the legislature, so this is data from the House of Representatives, this is some old data. Uh, there are, there are, a lot of the legislative process happens on, you know, in committee, right? You know, back in the 70s, you had, I'm just a bill, sitting here, I'm stuck in committee, blah, blah, blah. You know, I used to love that cartoon. Um, the, the network representation here that's being sliced and diced and put into this tree here. This is again, this is exactly like the, I took the tree of the karate club and wrapped it around. Now I'm doing it with communities, I'm sorry, with committees in the House of Representatives. And the connection here is that each one of these dots is a committee or a subcommittee and they're linked to each other because they have common membership. The same people sit on multiple committees. And so you might ask questions about how this committee structure changes with political events or how it might influence the legislative process. Um, the, the big take home message from this work through a sequence of papers was that um, you know, the, one of the major changes in the committee structure in the House of Representatives in the last 20 years was really sort of two big changes. One of them came with the 1994 elections and the so-called Republican Revolution. And another piece came with the reorganization of uh, the Select Committee on Homeland Security following 9-11. You would like to think, or I'd like to think, this is sort of my terrible statement that I'm now putting on videotape, I guess, for you to have forever. You would like to think or I would like to think as a, as a lay person with some political interests as a good citizen that when the Select Committee of Homeland Security was formed, it would involve lots of expertise from people who had spent their legislative careers studying intelligence or armed services or you know, even, even maybe even veterans affairs and the budgetary impacts of such things. No, it turns out that uh, the Select Committee on Homeland Security and its subcommittees, which are over here in Maroon, are most affiliated with House administration. These are the people who, you know, rename things Freedom Fries, and, um, and the Rules Committee. So these are the ideologues of both parties. So this is an equally bipartisan statement um, on both parties basically saw this as an opportunity uh, that this was going to be the you know, biggest reorganization of the federal government in our lifetimes. And so their most powerful members should be on this committee. And uh, that was sort of the take home message of this work. So now having depressed you with. So that one was still just doing Newman Gervon. Yeah, at that stage, because that's sort of taking the committee as it exists at one time. Um, so having depressed you with that, I'll just say that we've done other things with the Congress. We've looked at co-sponsorship. You can, you can um, learn, a, you can learn some interesting things about partisanship and polarization in the House and in the Senate by looking at uh, well, in particular, here's an example from the Senate of um, here the, the data is when did two senators, one of them co-sponsor the legislation sponsored by another one. And so you're tracking through the legislative process prior to the votes in the sponsorship stage. And the surprising thing, um, this was work again done with Mason, but also with James Fowler down at UCSD, who's a political, science, uh, political scientist uh, and a group of students. Um, the, the surprising result here was is that we identified through these methods 
the left-right or uh, Democratic-Republican split at the level of, of co-sponsorship that was not widely regarded to be something that you should be able to identify at the co-sponsorship level for various political, uh, political science theory reasons. It was essentially a belief that the co-sponsorship level was more complicated. It was more clustered into smaller, fined uh, purposes and, and motivations. But in fact, it's very well organized left-right. This is for all all bills. So yeah. This is the yeah. This is sort of the, the complete data of co-sponsoring bills, so not laws. If right. Look at the ones that won, uh, that they passed. Oh yeah. Give you an insight. I haven't looked at that subset. Um, it's possible James has. James has done a lot of with this data. The James Fowler has done a lot with this data. So, um, you know, if you kind of go around here, we've color coded them by are they Democrats or Republicans? And again, the tree sort of splits here, um, the root being in the center. So the first split is everybody over here versus everyone over here. And you can see mostly it's blue over here, mostly it's red over here, and uh, up to likely suspects being across the data. Well, of course, so that's one bill right. in a sea of but all, bill, but it is a major bill. And yeah, so one of the, one of the things we have not done at the level of this work is divide, uh, divide up the bills by any, uh, by any importance. And uh, one more quick picture, well, I'll skip that one. We'll go to the one that looks nicer, um, is, uh, is some work that, uh, some visualization work that, that Jim Moody and I have been doing together. So, so now we're looking again at legislators, but we're looking at them that they're connected by the strength of similarity of their actual voting patterns. So we've looked at the committees that they've sat on. We've looked at the way that they co-sponsor legislation together. We've done some other fun things with roll call data, with the way they vote, how similar are their voting patterns. And it's, perhaps, it's not surprising that you can take that and you can, tie, you can break it up into here are mostly Democrats and here are mostly Republicans because Democrats tend to vote with Democrats and Republicans tend to vote with, Demo with Re Republicans tend to vote with Republicans. And what is also being shown in this picture here is just that we've done this over many, many sessions of Congress. So, in, so this is, these are two year um, congressional terms, both the first session and the second session of, of each two year term. If you start to think about this, okay, well, I've, I've thrown you a, a sequence of pictures. This is getting to be silly. We're looking at the same people. They're, they're, they're connected to each other because they sit on committees together. They're connected to each other because they co-sponsored each other's legislation. They're connected to each other because they vote in similar or dissimilar ways. They might be connected to each other because they represent the same state. They might be connected to each other because their offices are near each other and thus they, they've had opportunity to influence each other. And they're the same people going from one time, one two-year time window here to the next two-year time window because they're re-elected. Shouldn't we be using all that data at one time? Well, I'm not going to promise that I'm going to use all the data, but I'll at least use a larger block of the data together once I've told you very quickly how I'm going to use it. So, so we're back to this notion of I don't just have one adjacency matrix. I don't just have one network, but that network is just one layer or one slice of this larger set of data that might represent all the different ways they're the connected and at different times. And so if you, want to think, if you want to think about this picture at an adjacency matrix level, well, I might have some adjacency matrix A1 that represents what's going on here. I have some adjacency matrix A2, A3, A4. And they all are sitting in some larger adjacency matrix gluing together all of these nodes in the picture here. And now the question becomes, well, what do I really mean by these slices? Are, 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 yes? Yeah. Right. In some cases, I guess they are just discrete whether it's zero or one. Right. Whether they could sponsor bills together or not. But in the Karate Club, for example, you, the friendship presumably is a real number. Right. right. So how large is the subjective element involved? I mean, how, how would you raise some of these friendships with Karate Club? Well, there's sort of two parts to that question, right? That, that if I understand your question, I mean, one of them is is 
is how are you going to go about doing that? And there is a weighted version of the Karate Club data, and it's, you know, basically was a subjective measure made by Zachary while, observe, while he was observing this club. A, a second piece that I might try to pull as a thread out of your question is what's the, what's the, what's the scale of these numbers? Well, how stable? Like, oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a lot of work on um, so how robust, how robust is some the yeah there there is some wonderful work um, addressing exactly that point by Mark Newman and and uh, one of his students Brian Carer um, and I can point you to the reference on that. Um, so uh, so let me let me uh, sort of bring bring just out the distinction here between ordered and categorical very quickly that. Ordered might be this example, um, say, say you had data running in time. I'm me tomorrow. I'm going to be me the next day. So this actor is connected to themselves through what are actually ordered slices. And it might make sense to just have nearest neighbor connections, in which case you have some large adjacency matrix with the block diagonal. So these are all the nodes in the first slice connected to each other. These are all the nodes in the second slice connected to each other. But then there's a coupling between the first and second slices. These might be four different kinds of connections, in which case it doesn't make any sense for there to be an ordering to these connections. Rather, there's an all-to-all -all identity connection here. And in which case, in that categorical case, you might have all of these, um, you might have just large identities off the diagonal representing those connections. This detail won't be, this detail affects the level of what the adjacency matrix is and what the couplings are across. But what we're going to do with it won't matter. Uh, to that level of detail other than it needs to be respected. Again, our, our, big, our big question here for this talk is, well, all right, given that we have data like that, so here I'm just happening to show you the matrix for the ordered slices, how do we pick PIJ? And they're there. They're not random. They're definitional. So how are we going to do this? And our way out is this wonderful duality that Renaud Lambiot and his collaborators uh, recently identified that this back of the envelope modularity idea, where we're sitting and, and, and predicting the expected weight of an edge between i and j as a, as a probability problem, is in fact also a random walk problem. So then they, instead of looking at arguments based on probabilities and independence conditional on certain constructions, they asked questions about the expected spread of random walks on a network. So this is, this is so-called Laplacian dynamics. This is basically just diffusion. What's the expected population of walkers once they've started at a point going through time? And so what, um, not, not spending a lot of time on the math, so what they're doing is they're looking at processes that I'll just sort of try to explain one of these equations because I think it's, it's useful. So they looked at, at systems of differential equations where the population at node i changes in time according to this simple linear process. So um, it's a unit rate leaving this minus pi is outside the sum. It's a unit rate leaving pi. And well, where do walkers go when they leave node i? They go to the places that node i is connected to. So if they're leaving at unit rate, then with probability, so there's some degree of that node. And with some probability, they're landing on the neighboring nodes. Well, since they're going to go out on all the edges of i, their probability, well, so this is, this is leaving node i. Their probability, we should say this better, the probability of coming into i is they've got to now come from all of i's neighbors. So pj, these are the populations at node j. And only considering those j's that i is actually connected to, and all of the walkers at node j are leaving node j, and they're uniformly spreading out among the kj weighted edges leaving node j. So some fraction of those are going to land at i. And this is a simple linear system of ODEs. It has a very simple equilibrium. And here's sort of the really neat part. What, what Lambiot and, and his collaborators found was that modularity, this nice idea, count the total number of edges inside of a community minus what you would expect at random, is exactly the same at looking at this dynamics at equilibrium. 
So let this thing sort of go and run towards equilibrium, and then ask about the autocorrelation of staying in a community. So if you're already in, a, if you're already in community six, what's the probability that in unit time under this process you stay in community six? That probability summed over all of the communities at first order expansions is identical to modularity. And that turns out to be, so I'm not going to show you the math. The math is all buried in the supplement of the paper. But this, this was our way out. Our way out was, OK, we're not going to do back of the envelope probabilities conditional on certain things being held fixed. Let's look at Laplacian dynamics on this multi-slice network. So I have connections within each slice. I have identity arcs across the slices. They're different kinds of connections. How are we going to get to what's the right Laplacian dynamics? Where I, told you about the, I already told you about the Barber bipartite model. Well, the Barber bipartite model, the way you need to fix this picture is you need to say, OK, when I leave a blue node, I have to land on a red node and turn the crank on the Lambiot idea, and you exactly recover the Barber null model. There are uh, the, the liked Newman directed null model. How do you recover that? Well, it turns out that there what you need to do is you need to look at multiple types of flows. Every edge has an arrow on it. It says I points to J. So you need to look at Laplacian dynamics that both follow the arrows and go against the arrows. But when a random walker leaves, an, leaves a node along an arc pointing out, wherever it lands, it has to land along an arc pointing in. Those kinds of logical consistencies imposed on exactly the same Laplacian dynamics recover the directed null model. There's also a beautiful null model for how do you handle um, networks with signs. You might have positive kinds of interactions and negative kinds of interactions. And there's a, a beautiful back of the envelope probability model for that. And we recover that by, by saying, OK, well, there are these different kinds of flows. And if you go out a positive edge, you might be going out positive edges at different time scales than you're going out negative edges. The point of this slide is not to say, is not is, is not for you to, uh, is not to have well communicated everything that we've, the details of how we did this. It's the theme of what we did, which is that we took this Laplacian dynamics idea and we, we showed precisely how we needed to modify it so that not only did we recover Newman Gervan modularity the way Lambiot had done, but that we can recover the Barber null model for bipartite networks. We can recover the liked Newman null model for directed networks. We can recover the signed null model. So having done all of that, it turns out that we also have exactly everything we need to handle these two different kinds of connections we have in the multi-slice framework. We have connections inside of the slices. We have connections that go across the slices. And the formula ends up being really simple. So it's, it's, all, it's deceivingly simple. It's kind of what you maybe just should have written down to start with. But we didn't just write it down. We, 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 we in a sense, derived it from this, uh, from this comparison with the other null models. And what you get is, is that the total quality of a partition is summing up the qualities inside the individual slices. So I other, up to a change of notation where I'm now calling things underneath m's instead of w's. Um, the, and that's just a normalization factor, so it's unimportant. Our data is now not just that we have an adjacency matrix, but we have, we have if you like, an adjacency tensor. We have node i is connected to node j in slice s by different weights. And we're going to sum over all slices, or really all pairs of slices. But you can see here there's a delta SR factor. So really what we're doing is we're, we're summing over each individual slice. What's the modularity from that slice? And then there's an additional contribution that you get through this derivation, which is some weight of how important is it to include those cross slice arcs inside of a partition. Um, and uh, and so I, what I should probably just conclude with is a couple pictures of this. The, uh, damage is, uh, problematic yeah, and, and and it might be different inside of each slice, and I mean, so there's a lot of there are a lot of knobs to tune on this machine in order to get good results. And um, so what I'll do is I'll actually I'll skip two of the examples that are in the paper. There's a um, 
we look at, we look at uh, the, the Karate Club, but we try to look at multiple resolutions. We look at some interesting Facebook data called Taste, Ties, and Time. I'm going to skip those just to finish and so show something fun. Um, roll call networks. So I, I showed you very briefly this notion that we, we've, had, um, we've had a lot of fun, and I think it's been, it's been useful, um, at least according to my political science colleagues, it's been useful, to consider the network of connections between legislators based on a notion of how similar are their voting patterns. Well, of course, you've, you've got data in different windows. We've been looking at two-year congressional term windows. You could, you could look at much more uh, finely resolved windows. I'm not going to do any of that today. I should say that it's kind of a funny notion. So we're going to define a network within a window as the fraction of the time that those two legislators voted the same way normalized by the total number of times. So this is a fraction of times that they voted the same way, normalized by the total number of bills that they were both present and voted on. This is an, an odd network. Um, again, this is a, a picture of a, a scientific co-authorship network that I showed you earlier. This is what the adjacency matrix of a roll call network tends to look like. This happens to be a, the 85th Senate. This is 1957 and 1958, the first of the major civil rights era legislation, uh, civil rights bills was, was during this period. Re re relatively contentious time. It's color coded. Red is uh, senators who voted very closely uh, across the two year period. Blue are, are almost opposites. And you can see, okay, well, there's kind of a cluster up here. It's kind of a cluster down here. Well, maybe there's some overlap in here. Um, it, this is, you know, it's clearly polarized, but it's nothing like today. Um, so this is the 110th Senate. So this is um, so this is uh, what are we? We're, in the, we're 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 early into the 112th right now. So I, so I haven't done the 111th yet. But yeah, but you basically have this team votes together and this team votes together, and very rarely. So haven't gotten myself in trouble since you're taping this. Um, that's kind of you know scary. We'll just push through that. Yeah. Well, so lots of times when we talk about networks, we're talking about structures that look like this. They're very sparse. There's very few connections. So, so thinking of this as a network, you kind of have to think a little differently. It's, not a, spar it's a, not a network with very few connections. It's a weighted network. It's sort of everybody's connected to everybody else, but the weights matter a lot. And so it's, even though it doesn't look like this picture with very few connections, it, you can still think of it as a network as long as you're including the weights. Everything's connected. The most polarized senators on two ends voted, they at least both voted to congratulate Sammy Sosa on his 500th home run. Um, a real bill. Um, so I'll just conclude with this picture, since I'm, I'm now running over time, which is that we've, we've had a lot of fun doing historical analyses of this. And so again, there are a lot of knobs on this machine that you can tune. But you have to pick how strong is the coupling between them. You have to worry about what your resolution parameters are inside of the slices. You pick values. You process. You see data. You want to not just stop there. You want to do this you know, sort of many times over. But this is a fun graphic that, that I enjoyed putting together. which was So this is the entire, um, this is the 220-year history of the Senate over 110 slices. So each one is a, uh, the first through the 110th Congress. And um, the, each one of these dots is a senator in a two-year Congress. So they've been sorted so that the sen a, a given senator, this is the same senator um, uh, by, by, well, so this is sort of an, uh, this is a better example. So this, these four blue dots in a row are the same individual just in four different time periods. So they're connected to themselves there. And the color coding is which community in this big multi-slice network of senators in different time windows did they get placed into algorithmically. So you, you see patterns. Um, I mean, there's a big blue group and a big red group, colors chosen for obvious reasons. Um, the red group here contains a certain, a, a large number of situations of people who nominally call themselves Republicans, a smaller number of dots of people who called themselves Democ Democrats and, and a handful of leftovers. Uh, when I show pictures like this, people want to know, well, which one's the party of Lincoln, say, as an example. Well, other than Lincoln was not a senator, there's, um, there's a, a, a little issue that the answer is nobody. So because you see these, these shocks in the system where 
So here the, the reds suddenly all die out, and then there's a big group of yellows. And the interesting thing is in almost every one of these slices here, there's only two colors. Of the two-year slices, there's only two colors. Like, so if you're back up here, right, everybody's either a red or a blue if you look at one of these slices. And that goes back through here, and then there's suddenly a, a bunch of green dots. Well, what are those? Those are the four Congresses of the Civil Rights era, and there are 44 instances of people who called them Democrats, every one of them from a southern state. Um, their voting pattern was different. Um, it, you, you go back a little further, there's an instance here, there's some overlap, there's some blue, there's some red, there's some yellow. What is this? Well, this is basically the, this is the 1932 election following the start of the Great Depression. Most of the Republicans got kicked out. You have a major turnover. And um, so, you know, we've, we've sort of found this fun. I mean, how politically useful this particular data set is, 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 is up to a political scientist to decide, not me. But it's using these kinds of tools, you can have the ability now to partition, not just within a single piece of data, but across pieces of data. And uh, so I, I think I'll just conclude there and say that, that uh, you know, if, you've, if you've got any other questions about this, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about it even now after the talk or point you to the paper or talk about it later on. Um, we think this is a great, a great hammer now to hit some data with. And, and I should give a shout out to, uh, to Danny Bassett here, um, working with uh, Gene Carlson and also with Scott Grafton here on, on campus, they've already taken this tool and done just the most amazing things with uh, brain network data under learning conditions. Um, looking at fMRI data and, and the different ways that the brain activity is correlated across time, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to cluster data. If you've got data that you think might be amenable to this kind of approach, I, I would love to talk more about it. And other than that, thank you for your attention. Yes, there is a lot of interest in that. I mean, at the level of, of this conversation, that's, that kind of data is merely being co coded as what is AIJ at, some, at different times. But there are a lot of, um, there is a lot of interest in models of dynamic networks. There's a lot of work, um, uh, particularly in, uh, there's a whole statistics of networks body of literature called exponential random graph models. And there's a lot of work on um, Markov models for, for including time in exponential random graph models. Um, it's, it's an active area that people are trying to get their hands on. And this is really the, OK, given some data for this, how might I try to, uh, try to see the structures in it? Right. So it's, of course, uh, special dynamics for getting into this static uh, result. So uh, does, does it have anything to do with your dynamic? And can there be any synergy between the two? Um, there, there's definitely synergy between the two. At, and, and one of the levels is, is that, so if I understand your question, I mean, with what you're saying, some of what I'm thinking about is a lot of the computational heuristics that I have deliberately skipped talking about. I, I basically said, here is a modularity. Go, combinatorial, go do combinatorial optimization on this somehow. And there are a lot of dynamic processes that can be used to find good optima to that problem. A lot of those methods can be ported straight over to this situation because the multi-slice modularity definition is, is exactly the same as the modularity framework was before, just with a null model that respects these different kinds of connections within the slices and across the slices. But a lot of the same algorithmic ideas um, apply directly, which is one of the nice things, uh, one of the things that I think makes it useful. No. Uh, in terms of random walk uh, aspect, 
the Google page rank has some, but it's just much more sophisticated. Well, right. So Google PageRank is 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 basically a centrality measure. It's it's um, you're you're identifying not the well. I won't go back to it, but there was a. This is looking at what are the autocorrelations of the walkers already at the equilibrium population. The equilibrium, the strengths of the equilibrium populations set up in the right way in the page in the page rank framework the the number of walkers the expected population of walkers is effectively what google page rank is capturing it says it's a different it's a different random walk process also i mean it's got teleportation and it's weighted differently but it's it's related in that sense this is really looking at the fluctuations around that average so that if you're already inside of a group you know, a well-defined group is one where if you started walking inside that group, you're likely to stay in that group. But the total population might be telling you something about how central that group is or individual pages inside that group, how central they are in the network as a whole. And that's really what the page rank question is trying to get to. How central is a web page? Right. So, so I, 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 so I didn't want to show you any of that. So, uh, which picture do I want? I want this one. Clearly, right there are in this example. I, I skipped saying that, but clearly there are senators who are not there and then are suddenly elected, or maybe then leave for a while and come back later. That's a that's just a more complicated, off diagonal contribution. If if a senator is in Congress T, and then not in T plus one, there's no identity arc because the person's not there. So we're only keeping track of the identity arcs in this situation right here between uh, nearest neighbor congresses in time and whether or not that senator appears in that next Congress. If they're there, there's a contribution. There's a, there's a propensity to grouping them the same way. There is a positive contribution you get from that. If they're not there later on, well, then they're just not in the data, so there's no identity arc. But it's a nice feature of this. Uh, so to me, it's a very nice feature of this uh, multi-slice modularity that just fell out of the derivation, that it handles that situation without any need to explicitly account for uh, a node being there or not being there, other than whether there is an identity arc. Um, I, I've never looked. That's a great question. I've I've never looked at data like that. Yeah. Um, what I a lot of these people are friends with each other. Yeah. Either university level or some secret Well, one of the things I'll say, so I'll say two quick things to that, which is just that um, if if you've got data and you think it's interesting to look at it, I'm always game for looking at these things. With the caveat, um, as said well by um, one of my colleagues at, at UNC. Um, who, who I've started doing some work with, so his name did not appear here yet. Um, he, prior to going to graduate school, actually worked for the Secret Service. And so he and I have a, are sort of, a, of a, we're sort of cautious about the, uh, shall we say, homeland security applications of our work. Because um, when they talk about removing nodes, they mean with extreme prejudice. And, uh, and I, don't think I, I don't think I want that responsibility. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah. However, I discovered there is a way of compounding and dealing with this. Just share your account with a bunch of teenage children. <laughs> <laughs> 
It doesn't know how to recommend anything to you, does it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Forrest.